Well, good day, everybody. Welcome to another Faith Seeking Understanding. I am Alan Bevere, your host. I am a pastor, retired uh, professor of Bible moth, a theologian in exile, and a peddler of hope. And I am the self appointed and some of Canterbury Chair of Podcast Theology and Culture here at Faith Seeking Understanding University, a completely made up university, but where all seekers are invited to ponder profound things free of charge. And on this monthly episode of Calmly Considered, my friend, as always, and our and as we talk through it, Michael, what do you mean you're on a barbecue cruise? <laughs> Who is that the, could never happen. That could never happen. <laughs> and he is the uh, Grand Poobah Chair of Economics and Public Theology here at FSUU. Michael, good to see you. How you doing today? I'm doing great. Getting ready for the celebrate the 4th of July here. How are you? Yeah, getting ready to celebrate the 4th. In fact, uh, this will be posted after the 4th, but it is the 4th today, just so everyone knows. And uh, right. I assume that since you're in Kansas City, on the fourth, you will probably have barbecue somewhere. Probably going yeah. out to the to meet with family later this afternoon. Okay, so okay. I'm, I suspect there could be barbecue in the mix. We'll see. You know what's interesting <laughs> around me? Around me, I mean, there's barbecue places, but you know what I really like? I mean, i I like I like ribs with just dry rub on. Yeah, there you I go. don't. I'm you know. I mean, I'm okay with barbecue sauce on it as long as it's not too sweet. But right. I really love ribs with a good dry rub. That's it. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to find where I am. It's probably you're probably more like uh, Tennessee, that kind of area. Probably yeah, that kind of. Yeah, yeah, we get a lot of we get a lot of sauces. I mean, you you know, we did have a place here in Ashland that was just wonderful for ribs, and they, they right, you know, they were getting older. They this couple that owned it and decided it was time to close it down. Yeah, and uh, so that was really disappointing, but. Yeah. Boy, so anyway, I guess I'm just going to have to learn to make them myself. There you go. That's so, the way to do it. Anyway, yeah, exactly. I do make dry rubs with my hot peppers. You know, I dehydrate them and then right. I mix them with other seasoning. So yeah. uh, I could make a good well, dry rub. I, I have I've always been tempted the idea to do my own barbecue, but I've yet to find barbecue seeds. I don't know how to grow those yet. So. Well, that's really tough. The barbecue <laughs> seeds. Yeah. Yes. So it's. Uh, yeah. It's yeah. Pound. Yeah, it's it's kind of tough with the barbecue seeds. So, you know, anyway, and if and you can find them, they're really expensive. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. 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 All right, Michael. We better we better get into the subject before we lose our listeners. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so today's episode is what if some of our problems really aren't problems or how not to make stupid arguments. Yeah. So why don't you uh why don't you begin the conversation by uh sort of explaining what that means yeah well a lot of times we talk about there is a problem we, we perceive that something is is not right and so we've got the solution and we're going to to promote that solution and decide how to fix it and i guess the question is is what if our problems really aren't necessarily problems to be solved let me come at it this way if you're talking about breathing which do you prefer inhaling or exhaling and I think the answer is most people prefer both if you if you'd like to stay alive and trying to. Well, sometimes some... sometimes in National County in the spring around farms, yeah. I don't really care to inhale, <laughs> the inhaling, but part. I right. have no yeah. choice. <laughs> and sometimes we prefer one a little bit more than the other. Yes, That's exactly right. 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 Yes. Yeah. Um, but <clears throat> the, the idea is, is that if you want to stay alive, you got to embrace both poles yeah. of, of the uh, the breathing apparatus and trying to find some happy balance between the two and staying there is called being dead um that you have to have two vibrant aspects of the, the breathing apparatus and that applies to so many things outside of just biology to human systems to um human involvement um and i think many times what we're looking at is that to, to use the metaphor we've latched on to the problem that we're not inhaling enough and so everything needs to be about inhaling and we can actually end up killing and creating uh, ill health because we have become attached to one pole. And then somebody grabs onto the other pole and says, no, this is the right way that it has to be done. When in fact, what we're looking at is balance. I think I first came across this book by a guy by name of Barry Johnson called Polarity Management. Yeah. And he's inviting us to look at many of the things that we look at as problems 
as not as problems, but as polarities that have to be managed. And I was first encountering this when we were talking about uh, doing some congregational development, churches trying to vision what they wanted to do in the future and what, you know, what kind of things they needed to prove what they wanted to do. And to just use a very loose um, analogy, the idea is that you have some people on a church board who, who think the church needs to be more structured. They need to, to have their programs in line. There needs to be accountability. Um, you need to have all these systems in place to operate things. And there's a good side to that. And the good side to that is that things are organized, things run efficiently, people know where to plug in, uh, they know what to do, there, there's accountability, accountability in the system. But there's also a downside to that, which is it tends to stifle creativity. It tends to lock in the people who've been doing the stuff to be the only people that keep, can do, keep doing the stuff. Um, you don't tend to be as adaptive, you're not moving on to the new ideas. So as you begin to become too structured, there begins pressure to become less structured. And so you have people, we need to be relying on the spirit. We need to have more people involved. We need to be more free form and not so rigid about things. And how are we gonna, you know, just, just respond to the spirit. So then you begin to move that direction. And eventually what starts happening is you have all this new and exciting stuff. And there's lots of energy and people are getting involved, but then new people can't figure out how to get plugged in because there's no structure to things. They don't know to, how to, to get involved. Uh, mistakes are made because there's no accountability. Um, other things are falling through the cracks because nobody's trying to think through the whole thing from the, the total picture and, and making sure that the details uh, get taken care of. And then that begins to push you back to the positive side <laughs> of the structure again. And so that dynamic, there, that is a healthy dynamic to, to have that tension between those two things. And the issue is, is that for most of us on any polarity, we tend to have a preference towards one pole or other of the personality, experience, whatever reason, we tend to have a preference towards one direction or the other. And I think that a lot of the things that we identify as problems, if we often stopped and took time and said, when, when there's disagreement, I, I want structure. Uh, Joe over here, he wants, he wants things to be more freeform. If I can acknowledge some of the downside of the structure value that I have. What are the potential problems with that? Joe is more able to hear me talk about why I, I think that there needs to be structure. And if Joe can acknowledge what the downside is of having too much uh, carefree response to things without structure, then I can begin to hear more what he's talking about. So the idea of recognizing that there's positives and negatives to these poles that exist in these polarities and then begin to have conversation about how can we, for the moment, what do we do next leads to, I think, more um, productive outcomes. It doesn't always lead to agreement. Um, and it often means compromise, not getting all of, of what you want, but it leads to a healthy dynamic that, that creates a, a vital uh, system, vital organization. And so I just use that example from within the church, but I think you can expand that to, to families. I think you can advance to schools, to, to government, to all sorts of things. Um, that a great many of the things that we identify are problems are really more polarities that we're trying to, to manage. Right. So that's, um, that's my so, answer. Yeah, no, that's a, good, that's a good way to start us out. So I, you know, uh, one of the things that, um, as someone who obviously writes, has been involved in conversations and, you know, in the public setting and all of that kind of thing <laughs> is we 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 do we do drift toward these uh the the the, the polarity the one polarity that attracts us and right. I mean how many times I, I'll write something and uh the response is well yes I agree with you but and then they say we need to you know like I write right. a post on holiness well, right. I agree with you, but, but we need grace. Well, I didn't say we didn't need grace, right? <laughs> right I, yeah. I, in fact, yeah. actually, as a good Wesleyan, I believe holiness is a byproduct of the grace of God. Or if I write about grace, I'll say, well, yes, we have to have grace, but there are also boundaries. There are do's and don'ts. Yeah. Yes, right. I didn't say there aren't, right? Yeah, right. Yes, and so yes. it's that we do tend to emphasize one over the other. I see this. I see this all the time in other other issues. You know, immigration. Let's pick up on immigration. Right. Um, there are those who want to um, emphasize uh, border security and mm -hmm. and strong borders and a and a uh, a good vetting process for immigrants, et cetera, et cetera. 
uh, people like me who believe in generous immigration, uh, because right. I've got reasons for that, don't right. believe in open borders. Exactly. Right? Yeah, we don't think right. that at all. Or on the right. other end, um, you know, those who believe in generous immigration uh, don't, you know, will often accuse people who emphasize border security as being um, sometime racist. And of course, there are right. racists out there, for sure. Right. But right. but also people who don't care about the stranger, et cetera, et cetera. Right. When their focus is on securing the border. And so it isn't, again, we this is not a problem to be solved. It's something to be managed. And that right. you can have you can have a both and, in fact, I would argue that most issues are both and issues. Um, right, yeah. And that, but but here's the problem, Michael. First of all, uh, evolutionary biologists tell us we're hardwired toward the binaries. Yes, that, that's that, right. That our yeah. brains are hardwired toward the either or. So it's hard for us right. to think in the middle. Right. Um, and uh, the second thing is, is that... Um, that means that's a very uncomfortable place to be. Yeah, I, you know, we don't like we we like our world ordered. We like our yeah. view of the world to make sense. And so once I get this figured out, whatever this may be, I'm not interested in hearing someone who will come and say, "Yeah, but." Yeah, yeah, that's how, right. And so then that leads to what we've talked about on this show: the echo chamber. That I surround yeah. myself with people who lean toward my polarity, right. and I ignore those who want to remind us that it's not it's not all that way. Right, right. Well, and I think the to build on top of that is the the illusion or the falsehood, the belief that we can ultimately defeat and suppress those who have gravitate toward a different part of a polarity that they that they can ultimately be repressed and and dismissed because they are always going to be with us and if you get past that illusion and realize those people are always going to be there they're 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 going to be a part of the community then it is counterproductive to have a winner take all absolute you know victory mentality towards solving problems because you have to bring along the people and live as a community with those who don't agree with, with what is there. And so the solutions to me often seem to need to, to incorporate that, that that reality is there. And that's the reason that the American political system is designed so much the way that it is with checks and balances um, in which ultimately no issue is ever permanently resolved. There's always the opportunity. It requires a lot of effort, a lot of work sometimes to revisit some of these issues. But there is the possibility that that things can be uh, revisited, that, that we can we can modify them in the future. And that's what allows us to work together is to know that even if we have a debate, doesn't come out the way that I think it should. I think it's improper, even given a polarity, I think they've gone too far one direction or another. There is still you still live to fight another day, you live to fight another election, you live to 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 be able to develop a coalition of people that will agree with you, that will then win the day and, and move things in the other direction. And that to me seems to be about um, one of the ways that we manage a polarity is to have a a system, have our system set up that allows for those those competing views and ideas to continue to exist without having to have violence and destruction of differing people because we disagree with them. Right. So I think that that's, I, was, I think one of the articles I sent you, the guy said, says America doesn't have arguments. America is an argument. It's, you know, argument between unity and diversity. It's an argument between federalism and states. It's an argument between, you know, all these, these different things. Those are all polarities that, that exists within our system. So I think that that's one way is to set up the rules of the game, so to speak, that it requires us to, that, that no one can ever just have permanent dominance, that it always has to be about continually talking and persuading and creating coalitions of the majority in order to get what you, what you think is right. So, yeah, 
Yeah. That's, yeah. You know, every, every, every community, every society, every nation, every church, every movement always has a conserving element and a liberalizing element. Yes. Right. It yep. always does. Always does. Yep. You, you will never have a movement that will, will, that will eradicate either one. Right. Right. It just is not yep. going to happen. And right. so when when conservatives say liberals ruin everything or liberals say conservative conservatives ruin everything, they completely misunderstand the nature right. of living in the polarities because yeah. they are they're just there. Right. And so the key then is, you know, in 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 Methodism, uh, Methodism picked up from Anglicanism by a media, a third way, uh, a, a, we call it a third way. Yeah. Um, and now some people think it's it's just being a moderate, but it's really not. It's also sometimes <laughs> looking at issues differently. Yeah. But that so often what happened. So what often happened in the Methodist movement is Wesley charted a third course mm -hmm. between more conservative elements and more liberal elements in theology and in practice. OK. <clears throat> and and I don't want to I don't want to go off into uh, to the, the, the history on that. But the point mm -hmm. is, is that Wesley had this uncanny ability to many times see the validity of both sides yeah. of the argument. And so and given the fact that he also was pragmatic, um, sometimes sometimes not in a good way, but right. given the fact that he was pragmatic. He often charted a course for the people called Methodists uh, as a way in between the right. conserving and liberalizing elements. And right. I think what is happening now to take that into to our public discussions, whatever they may be, is that I think that the people right now who I'm going to say, it's not that those third elements are there, that, that there are people who embrace it, but the people who are making the most noise. Right. right now are on the on our, are on the extreme polarity exactly that, and, right. and and that right. they don't see you talked about compromise and in, in, in not getting everything you want there are too many people today the loudest voices would call you a compromiser if right. you True. were a republican you'd be a rhino if you right. were a democrat you'd be a republican <laughs> uh, you know in disguise right. And yeah. so the thought of managing these mm -hmm. issues as opposed to solving them, meaning solving them in the way I believe they need to be solved with no uh, with with no revisions. Right. It's really hard, isn't it, to have to yeah. have really constructive conversation. It is. And so much of it's in sound bites, And you have so many politicians that are not there to be statesmen or statespeople. Uh, they are they are there basically to promote themselves, to to uh, get clicks on their podcasts and their their uh, fundraising efforts and so on. Uh, it's a uh, it's very self focused and self centered that has really nothing about seeking the public good of uh, through right. through politics. There have always been those people in politics. It's just that they seem to be ruling today at the moment. Today. Well, and I think that's, I think yeah, that's right. I, I think the yeah. other issue with that is is frankly all their their posturing they're for their post political life. They're they're not necessarily mm -hmm. interested in making a career in Congress. They they after they're done they want to get hired by a cable news outlet to be a pundit, there you uh, go. to be a commentator yeah. commentator and right. and you know uh, where you do where you can make some big bucks. I mean I. So, so they really, so they're not there having an interest in the common good per se, but they're there for, for their future, right. which is why, by the way, some of these politicians in the last election who won, but by very narrowly, you know, right. you would think that a, that a politician who is listening and paying attention to their constituents would say, all right, I won that election, but I, but, but it was, it was nip and tuck. And maybe I need to moderate some things out a little bit and listen to my constituents no, right. they're doubling down and going whole hog because it doesn't matter if they right. lose the next election, they'll be hired to, uh, you know, right. uh, pedal snake oil on a cable news channel and make good money. Their next grifting scheme. <laughs> their, ne their next grifting yeah. scheme. Yeah. And right. and we the, in the last decade, it has been proven that the American people can be grifted yeah, over oh and over, over and over again. Yes. Yes, yeah. exactly. So, so. 
Yeah. So and, and I, I, I think part of what that points to is that resolving a lot of these polarity problems um, in, in all sorts of institutions requires relationships. And I, I think that that's part of what's going on is there has to be a willing enough to recognize the humanity of a person that you disagree with to recognize that this can be a reasonable, caring person that for whatever reason, we don't agree on a particular issue. And I think as tensions escalate over a, a topic sometimes, I, I think I mentioned this before, we had a guy on a board that I served with, that was a police officer, but I always loved him because he would always often sit so quietly through, through many of the meetings, not offering much input. But occasionally when the, the disagreements would get going around a topic and you have people bantering back and forth about, well, we want to do this. Well, I think we need to do that. And so that off we go. He'd often interrupt. He'd say, okay. He says, if we do option A, he says, what's at stake? What, what do you feel is at yeah. stake if we do A? And to a person who's saying B, what do you feel is at stake? Because usually the thing we're arguing about is a proxy for some deeper concern that we have about something else. And we're arguing about the proxy instead of the real issues that we're concerned about. And then when we can hear each other's concerns and many times are capable of acknowledge, acknowledging and empathizing with, with those concerns, even though we may not agree with a particular policy, that at least creates a space where people can disagree, but recognize they're in community with people who share similar values, similar concerns, and are, and are, are working towards a common end. So it seems to me that, that that can happen. You can do that better, I think, in like a church structure thing where you have people more face-to-face -face more often and, and, and deal with those kind of issues. But it does strike me that that's one way that the church could model to the world a better way of, of uh, dealing with controversy and, and uh, some of these, uh, these hot button issues that we find around us in our culture today. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, uh, I learned as a young pastor that uh, a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times when <laughs> someone was upset about something happening in the church and having conversation with them, what I really discovered, that really wasn't the issue. Right. It was a trigger for a deeper concern they had. Exactly. Uh, where they thought they saw something going that might go that they didn't like. Right. So it was a proxy issue, as you say. You know, I, I watched a, I watched a news story a while ago about how, uh, you know, 30 years ago, uh, politicians in Washington on both sides of the aisle had friendships. Yeah. And, right. you know, at the end of the day, they would go out for dinner or go out for a couple of drinks you know, Democrat, Republican, and they would talk with each other and they would know each other. And of course, some of the best compromise and conversation got done during that, those times. Right. Right. But now they say that it is, it is frankly rather rare to see friendships across party lines develop and that, you right. know, the politicians are staying with their own kind, so to speak. Well, you know, if, if uh, you and I are on opposite parties, Mike, on different parties and you and I right. don't have a friendship, how can I come and, and, you know, unless I get to know you uh, and come to respect you and, and um, take your opinion seriously, how in the world are you and I ever going to do anything in a bipartisan way if we don't know each other, if we're not exactly. in a relationship? And this is the problem, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's a big piece of it. I've heard some of the similar stories talking about people of opposing parties, even rooming together, having buildings where they, they room together and they stayed over the weekends. They were there for weeks at a time. And now it's, you fly in Monday morning and you fly out Thursday afternoon or Friday and you're gone. And so, and you just hang out with your group while you're, while you're there. So there's no way to um, develop those relationships and in just the quiet, non-stress times <laughs> of living. Yeah. And, and I don't know how to undo that, Michael. And I fear, that, either. I fear that it can't be undone because it's already so baked into the cake of our public discourse. Right. And we have 24 seven news media um, uh, adding to it. And so many people have gotten comfortable uh, living in their own world that makes them feel safe and, right. and confirms them. I don't know. I don't know. You know, George Will, the conservative commentator, uh, likes to say that sometimes there are some bells that can't be unrung. Right. Yeah. And I just fear that this bell has been rung so often and so deeply. I'm not sure how we get out of it. That That is a depressing right. thought to me, but I'm just not sure how we get out of it. Right. 
Yeah, I don't know what the answer, I don't know what this specific uh, solution to that is, but I think recognizing that the, the general principle of relationships and listening and hearing other people, maybe there's new ways that that begins to develop somehow, that there are people that are that are yeah. innovative enough to, to know in our current environment uh, that begin to, to have that model of, of uh, relating to others. I think there are there are some conversations that go on. I mean, I occasionally mm-hmm. hear about these on some of the less, um, what do I want to say, less visible hot button issues. There, there, there are people sure. that have these conversations both in the Senate and the House, and find ways to to try to to get to a majority on some of these things. So it's not completely lost, but it is certainly diminished. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I've always said how blessed I am because I have so many conversation partners locally to me, clergy and, and non-clergy. Uh, and we, in fact, we meet, we all meet rather frequently to talk. We don't always agree on stuff. And right. that to me is such a rich conversation because I, you know, I don't want to just sit down around the table yeah. with people who are always going to see it my way. Right. How do you, how do you grow? By the way, how do I, how do I come to realize that on something, I just might be wrong. Yeah. Right? It could happen, you and know. And how, how is, unless someone can, <laughs> yeah. who comes from a different perspective can offer me things to chew on, you know? Right. I, you know, we, I, if, if, you, if we haven't changed our mind on anything in 10 or 15 or 20 years, we just really, it, it's questionable whether we're <laughs> critical thinkers, right? Right. That's and it's right. questionable whether we've surrounded ourselves with people who can help us think critically because- I, I can't think. I always say when people say think for yourself, I say I can't think for myself. I don't know how to think theologically right. from the great thinkers of history. I don't know how to think about politics from right. uh, people like you and others who I know and have talked to. I mean, I don't know how to think for myself. I mean, sure, right. I need to think critically. But right. there's this great conversation that we are having. And I think that conversation is is. Um, not very enriching if the only people I ever talk to or read think the way I do. Exactly. Yeah. We get that, and that gets back to the another issue that we've, I think, talked about in earlier episodes, the whole idea of confirmation bias, that we tend to seek out information that simply confirms um, what we already feel. And then that feeds into this whole polarity thing of my, my poll and the polarity is the one that has to be championed. And I'm, you know, Come hell or high water, the other guy's not going to win. Um, yeah, the, the, those things all all fit together. Um, but I, I did want to raise one other aspect of this too that I, I think in, we're talking about relationships um, the that we deal with and we're in disagreement with other people. But I was going to say one other from a more personal uh, application in terms of just in my internal life that I think thinking of polarities can be helpful too in terms of us thinking about how to to be a witness in the world and how we're going to live our lives our christian living so if i have an income there's three things i can do with that income i can spend it i can save it or i can give it to uh to others all three of those things are good and legitimate things to do yeah but how much do i do of which thing at any given time what 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 is the balance there is no answer to that there's no correct answer there's no one answer to that and that to me it's although it's three things it's it's a polarity issue because there are there are multiple good things that you could do and there are probably multiple right answers in terms of of how you you want to structure that and so i think to get out from under the pressure of of always feeling like we are not hitting the mark, so to speak, there may actually be multiple right marks to hit. And it's right. up to some, at some level, there is just an issue of personal choice as to, to how we, we, we want to balance things. But we do also need to be in conversation with ourselves and the delusions that we tend to create for ourselves about, well, I don't need to give, or, you know, I, I'm, being stingy with our money in terms of spending on ourselves and our family when we, we should be spending more to, to, you know, enrich our families or not saving enough uh, because we can't control our spending. You know, all of those are legitimate concerns. But on the other hand, need to recognize that there is no formula that you're going to get to that, that's going to solve that. 
And I think as I've gotten older, I find that that's true probably of the majority of things that, that I obsess about, that there are, there's a polarity issue involved there. Yeah. Um, multiple good things and, and trying to find the right balance. So I think that looking at things as a polarity versus looking at them as problems uh, that, that have a simple solution that we can find, I think yeah. is an important. Uh, that reminds me of uh, something years and years ago uh, that I was involved in, uh, in a, a previous church I served. I can tell the story because it was a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. And, <laughs> and um, I suspect many of the main actors are no longer living and I've lost contact right. with them, but there was an, an elderly woman uh, who was very generous, but she was too generous. And she was uh-huh. giving money to every person who called, every charity that uh-huh. called. She was, and you know, once they get your number and you give, they'll keep right. calling you to the place where she was getting herself in trouble. And, you know, her son contacted me to help out with that. And so for me, it was one of the, it was one of those issues where, hey, it's right. great that you're generous. It's great that you want to help. These are worthy organizations you're given to. These these are not scams. Right. And this is really good. But you also have to make sure you have enough left over for yourself. You also have to make sure, you know, that you don't get yourself in trouble as far as spending money that you want to leave to your children, that kind of thing. And so the key was to try to work out with her a balance. Uh, right. And which the son wanted to help her do. Right. Um, and probably because she'd gotten to the age where it was kind of tough for her to do that. Um, so it was it was so there was no either or here. It was right. it was it was let's manage this thing so that you can continue to be generous because you want to be generous, but also make sure you take care of yourself too, because there's nothing wrong with that. Right. 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 That's so, right. So so yeah. we need to think about again, it's hard to think in those categories with with certain other things. But, right. but we need to try. It, I mean, it's hard work, Michael. I always say that <laughs> thinking is hard work. Yeah. I do not care yeah. what anybody says. Thinking is hard work. And I think right. part of the problem with, uh, with people, I want to be careful here. Yeah. I don't want to cast too many aspersions. But I just, I just have come to believe there are people who don't want to do the hard work of thinking. Yeah. And it's easier just to lump everything into an either or. We've got right. a worker shortage because nobody wants to work. That is not yeah. true. Well, right. yeah, yeah, I'm sure there are people who would prefer not to work if they sure. didn't have to. But right. that just that doesn't that doesn't address the problem completely. Right. There there are other. It's a complex thing, right. and and so in, in in order to really get at it, we got to do some really hard thinking, and that means we've got to be knowledgeable, which means we have to read and we. Have, we have to, you know, be informed, and that's hard work too, and that's time consuming. Right. Um, right. But, but you know something, I always say, Michael, I always say, if you want to be a, a person who influences other people, if you want to be a person who uh, is knowledgeable, so when you speak, other people listen, then do the hard work of being informed. Right. If you don't want to do the hard work of being informed and getting to know these things, that's fine. But right. don't be telling everybody else what the solution is. Right. Right. Yes. I right. mean, I'm not going to, I, you know, I'm not a brain surgeon. I'm not about to start giving advice to people right. on their neurological problems. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but yet we do that. We do that. We, we, we are, and I've done it too. I mean, I'll confess, I'm not just pointing fingers here. There have been times when I have not been really knowledgeable about something and I piped up on it. I ended up looking really stupid in the end. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. But it's, you know, you know, if you really want people to take you seriously on something that's serious, do your homework. And right. otherwise, you know, just sit back and. Yep. Listen. Well, and uh, I, it's interesting you bring that topic up because I was just reading it article is it i can't remember how to pronounce the guy's name carrie neewolf is that how oh neewolf neewolf okay yeah neewolf carrie well, yeah I, th- I think that's it yeah uh, yeah i i've not heard it pronounced before but I've, I've seen him around many times posting around the social media and so on he had a recently a good post recently talking and i can't remember the exact title of it but seven things that pastors need to do if they're you know want to to have vibrant churches going forward and i remember i'm, I'm paraphrasing all this but one of the basic points he was making was is that when uh, that you are when you are preaching and you put together a sermon, 
and you begin to to talk about a topic about which you is not your, you know, your your purview, and you say stuff that's half baked that you haven't thought through that you know, everybody today has the internet, they have Google, they have you know, and you you just sort of slipshod throw something in there that you put together on Saturday night at nine o'clock uh, to to make a point in your sermon, and it turns out is totally biased half true, you know, that kind of thing, it destroys your whole credibility with your congregation. And that is more so true now than ever, he says, yeah. because people have the access to the information. So don't say stuff unless you've really looked at the stuff <laughs> to have an informed uh, opinion. You don't have to be an expert on everything. I mean, I don't think anybody's suggesting that, but to at least have an informed uh, uh, take on those things. And I, I think that that particularly the younger you go down the, the population in the population, the younger ages in the population, I think that gets more and more true. And yeah. I think that that's one of the reasons the church often has uh, challenge reaching younger generations is because they feel like, well, they say this kind of crazy stuff or half-baked things on these issues. Why should I believe anything about what they're saying yeah. about God or, or Jesus or anything else? Yeah. So I, I think that we're kind of wandering off on a topic for the polarity stuff. But I, I do think it points out to a, a more general sense of dealing with the polarities and the problems that we see um, with some humility and yeah. with some engagement, with some um, with some using our mind, our intellect to engage it. But I, I also want to get back to the point you said where we're we often binaries are so much easier, you know, where we can just lump things together. And I, I think one of the things I, I keep thinking about that as well, too, is that it's easier, but it's also true. I think many times the views that we have come from unexamined emotional commitments that we have in ourselves that we haven't recognized where what's driving that emotion uh, that's in us. To revisit our view on a particular point means also confronting those emotions that we have and digging into. And, and that is a very uncomfortable place very often. And it is very, a very hard thing to deal with. And I think that that's one of the challenges that we often have from where uh, if we want to deal truthfully and gracefully with, with issues is that not only do we have to intellectually wrestle with the topic, but then we're forced to turn inward to look at what emotionally, are, why are we so attached to this particular view yeah. And sometimes, you know, changing your intellectual view on sometimes can be a little uncomfortable, a little embarrassing. But when you find emotionally what's driving something and you find this may mean I have to change my entire identity as to who I am. Mm -hmm. And when I when I really confront this this emotional issue, that's pretty, <laughs> pretty yeah. daunting and challenging. Well, uh, yeah, yeah. And it, I mean, it becomes because it becomes part of our our, our understanding of reality. And yeah. And. And we, none of us wants to lose something of what we have come to believe that is so right. foundational. Uh, right. It's, it's very hard. It's very hard to do. And, yeah. uh, and, but, you know, I mean, I, again, the other thing is, okay, well, I mean, in the search for truth, this is what you get. I mean, I, yeah, I, right. I don't know how you can search for what is true without at times feeling really disturbed and uncomfortable. Right. Uh, if you're being honest, you know, I always like to say I go where the truth leads me. That right. doesn't mean I'm right everywhere. Uh, right. But yeah. what I hope it means is that if I go to a place seeking the truth and I find out I'm wrong, no matter right. how com uncomfortable it is, I hope I do change. Yeah, right. Right. Um, and, and the only reason, by the way, I can find out if I'm wrong on something is if I have conversation with people who don't agree with me. Right. That's the right. only way it's going to happen. Yeah. So, and examine those things. Yeah. Well, and I, I was going to say, I think I mentioned this before, but I always find the word disillusioned or disillusion, uh, find, find that an interesting word because it usually has negative connotations for us. We think of somebody dis disillusioned, that that's a terrible thing. They're in a bad place. But think about the word illusion, dis, you've been freed from an illusion. Yeah. Isn't that a positive thing? Yeah. But we associate yeah. it as negative because that illusion was what yeah. was giving us meaning. And suddenly that's been taken from us. Yeah. And so disillusion is actually a positive thing. That's yeah. a good thing because yeah. now you're being brought to the truth. Yeah. But we always experience it as painful and something that's bad. 
Um, so yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's right. You know, one of the things that we see happening right now in our society, Michael, is the the having to face the uncomfortable uh, truth of American history in yeah. so many ways that, right. you know, we who are white. We, we I mean, we don't approve of slavery, never approved. Of, we're glad it's over. We think everybody should be equal. But right. we have wanted to treat slavery as kind of a blip on the screen. And yeah. not something that has been and discrimination, racism, right, has not something that has been de- in, in endemic and still is endemic to right. our culture. So we get upset with Black Lives Matter and critical race theory, and we want to write it off by saying, "Oh, it's socialist and that kind of thing." Yeah. Right. When the reality is, what's really going on is we don't want to have to face the fact that America is was built on race and was right. built on racial discrimination and right you know and so when white people say to me today well race shouldn't matter i say well it shouldn't but it has right for 400 years and we white people made it matter right so so now that the the minorities are getting a chance to tell their story and we're uncomfortable we say oh well race shouldn't matter well you know i'm sorry you don't get to do that yeah uh, right because they want to tell their stories and the stories are not good stories. And, right. and uh, it's, it's, so it's, so, so what it does is we're, we're having to reevaluate a worldview right. uh, and include that in. I still am struck by, I think I've mentioned this before, but struck by uh, when you go to places today, like Mount Vernon and Monticello, where they really uh, tell the story of slavery at these places right. and how upset some white people get. Right. And say, you know, I didn't go to Monticello to hear about slavery. I wanted to hear about Jefferson and everything. Again, right. not not even recognizing or wanting to face the fact that without slaves, there would have been no Monticello. Right. Right. Yeah, I, right. I mean, I mean, yeah. seriously. And so all they're doing now is trying to tell the story in its fullness, in a fuller way. Right. Right. And uh, some people are reject are reacting to it because, frankly, what is it? It's uncomfortable. Right. Yeah. Uncomfortable right. for us. Yeah. I've done uh, part of uh, one of my hobbies. I'm real interested in uh, the his- local history where I'm at, Kansas City history. And just, this is just one little snippet of things. Um, looking at Kansas City in 1850, um, when it was forming and, and becoming a town and everything of, of significance. And I've read, I've read all these histories and people talking about the histories, the people that are interviewed and so on. But you look at the census records, one in four to one in five people that were here in this area were slaves. Yeah. And you don't hear any mention of their contribution, their story into what was happening in this this little region right here. It's all about the white folks and, and what they said. And there's just this whole missing chunk of what was also contributing uh, to, to the way that this, this region developed and what was happening. Um, and so becoming aware of that and beginning to shift to the idea that the great things that some of these white pioneers and leaders did were indeed great. They were interesting, mm-hmm. they, were, they, they were innovative. And many of the things they did were also quite terrible. Yeah. And quite, uh, and, that, and that, if you look at the Bible, that is the Bible's description of humanity. Those things that are quite noble and amazing and things that are awful and terrible, that, that's what the Bible is. That's not critical race theory, that is humanity. That's what this the scriptural biblical view of humanity is. And uh, so I, I we, somehow we have to learn to embrace that. I do think the idea of looking at some of these things as polarities helps us to put things in better context yeah. rather than mm-hmm. seeing how that we have to grab one pole and hold exclusive to that to the yeah. destruction of all others. Yeah. Human history is a mess. Yes. It's a mess. Yeah. And if you want to if you want to learn about human history, you got to embrace the mess. Yeah. Right. That's <laughs> and right. so, you know, so, for example, like today's the fourth of July. So, again, um, uh, this will be posted after the fourth. But I was just thinking this morning, you know, today's fourth of July. We celebrate independence, uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, just a couple couple, three weeks ago, uh, we celebrated what is now a national holiday, Juneteenth, which is when. Uh, the slaves in Texas got the word on June 19th, I believe it was 1865, mm-hmm. that they had indeed been free. Um, and 
and you know, I know I know some white people who say, well, why are we celebrating that? We have the Fourth of July, and that's for everybody. Well, you know, have you ever talked with any of any black people? You know about that, right? Right. Why yeah. has Juneteenth been important for African Americans? Right. 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 Before it was a national holiday. Right. right? And so, right. what I think is, we can really begin to get at our history and begin to appreciate the good of it. Right. Right. Because the founders did have this great idea about freedom, right. though right. imperfect, because when yes. they were talking about all men being created equal, they meant men, mm -hmm. white men, landowners. Right. <laughs> right? right. Yeah. But yeah. it was but it was it, it was it was the beginning of something, you know, you know, yeah. the, when we talk about freedom and independence, all that, I don't see that as a static idea. I see that as something that's always in process. Right. And so our his so so we 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 look at the good of it and we can say, yes, that's a good thing that this right. this celebration of freedom that we celebrate today and all of that um, is important. But but we can't understand what that means in its fullness without Juneteenth. Right. Exactly. So I would be a big proponent of celebrating them. I keep them on the keep them on different days because we should do that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But I would like to see a tandem celebration to so that that helps us get to the fullness of these ideals that we say we believe right. without minimizing the bad stuff. Yeah. As Martin Luther King Jr. said, to live out the full meaning of our creed. Um, well, I that's think right. That, that's what we're looking for. And I, I agree with you. I think the founders were very insightful. The idea that, uh, that all men are created equal. That was a first seed that, that was planted that be, that grew and matured into the idea that everyone is created equal. And the other genius they had was to devise a governance system with separation of powers, with balances, with things that kept anybody from really getting control of the whole thing so that America could have not just have arguments, but it could be an argument <laughs> for, yeah. for now and forever. Yeah. Uh, over over some of these issues, that that's the brilliance of it. That doesn't doesn't discount any of the stuff that by look at from our standards today, looking back at how they live their lives and the values they have, we would be totally poor with with some of the values that they had. But they did plant that seed, and that to me, when I stand up uh, at a baseball game or some patriotic event, and I'm singing the national anthem, I don't sing it because of who America is. I sing of it because of the dream and the aspiration of what America says it hopes to be. And that yeah. that's what I see in that um, in the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. Uh, and this is Independence Day, but that we got independence from England. But Juneteenth is a wonderful celebration of Freedom Day. And I yeah. think that that's a those are slightly different things. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you know, again, uh, you, you mentioned Martin Luther King. I, I do think that one of the things that King challenged white Americans was you've got this creed, all mm -hmm. men, really all people will say all people right. are created equal. That's a really great idea. Right. Right. Now live up to it. Right. You, there yeah. are places where you have lived up to it, but not everywhere. Uh, right. th there's still more work to be done. And that's what King right. challenged us is, right. is that we embrace this, but we know that even in 2023, there's more work to be done. And people who think there is not more work to be done are either in denial or just plain, plain ignorant or both. Right. And uh, just as a footnote, I, I can't remember the guy's name. I want, I think I'm remembering it correct. I think his name is Alexander Campbell, who's the vice president of the Confederacy just as the states were all voting to secede from the union. He was, he wrote this speech called the Cornerstone Speech. And he identifies the fatal flaw in what the founders did when they founded the nation. And that was that they said this idea that all men are created equal. And he said that they, they said that, and then they allowed slavery and they just all thought that this would eventually wither away and that their vision would come true. And but we, he says, but we are founding this confederacy on the truth that all men are not created equal, right. and that slavery is. I mean, it, it, it's as explicit as you can get about yeah. the, the racism and, and the issues that are involved there. And so, it, the idea that all men were created equal was truly um, revolutionary uh, at the time. 
uh, and was resisted by many. And though given lip service today, I fear it's still um, not fully embraced. <laughs> it is <laughs> fully embraced. Many that are and, living today. And yeah. what I think the big problem today is is um, that race racism, uh, racial bias. What what concerns me more than anything is the implicitness of it today, where right. where white Americans will say we really aren't. I'm not racist. There is no racial bias. But then they proceed to uh, have opinions and support things that really are racially biased, and they just either don't know it or refuse to admit it. Right. And that's right. it's the unconsciousness. And right. And um, so. I always say if you want to if if you really are serious, if you're white and you're really serious about this idea that that there should be no racism and, and all people are created equal, don't just tell me you have black friends. That tells me nothing. Right. Tell me that you're willing to sit down with those black friends and ask, tell me about your experience. Yeah. As a black American. Yeah. Because they're not going to volunteer that to you. No. But if you sit down and say, I really want to listen to you, I'm not going to interrupt you. I'm just going to I'm just going to listen to you, because I'll tell you what, at 20, 25 years ago, I was one of those persons who, uh, you know, hated racism, you know, and everything, but didn't think there was an embedded problem. I, I was, you know, and it was listening to the stories of my African-American students in seminary that mm -hmm. really began to change my mind on this. Right. And the problem is we don't want to listen because, again, that that shapes our narrative in the wrong way. So what right. we end up doing is what I like to call white splain. And, yeah. you know, we, we tell African-Americans what their story really is. Now, one right. thing, let me say this real quick, Michael. I have noticed when I have engaged people on social media on this, mm -hmm. if I do it, my white friends who think I'm wrong will engage me. Right. But if one of my black friends chimes in in the comment thread to confirm by their experience that what I'm saying is true, those right. same white people will not engage the African-Americans. Right. Yeah. Right. They will yeah. not engage them. They'll engage right. me because right. I'm white, but right. they don't want to come off as being white splainers. Right. So they won't right. engage them. I've seen this happen time and time again. Right. And I, 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 I agree with everything you're saying there. I do think that one of the challenges, it seems to me, that for somebody who's Black is that they shouldn't have to be the face and the, the vocal piece for explaining everything Black to white people. They shouldn't. It's up, it's up to white people to figure out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, that's right, because, because you could argue historically. I mean, seriously, how do yeah. you not argue this? We created the problem. Right, exactly. So it's, it is a, it's a, difficult situation it's challenging yeah 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 well michael i think we're about at time here so um uh we have decided that there are some problems that really aren't problems and so hopefully all of us will make less stupid arguments right uh, don't know about anyone else maybe i will make less stupid arguments on times that would be a real that would be a real joy uh, maybe rip Maybe if we can just try to think in terms of the ideas with some of these issues that we wrestle about, is there a polarity? Is there, is a polarity? there another, is there another yeah. pole? I, I, I have this view. Is there yeah. another legitimate uh, reason to hold something that's different from mine? Yeah. And maybe should I be holding on to both of those yeah. rather than just mine? Yeah. I think just that mental exercise sometimes to just open the crack a little bit that maybe, maybe I don't have it all. Maybe we create, we create either yeah. wars that aren't. Right, exactly. They're, they're more right. both ends. All right, that's very good. Yeah. Well, thank you, Michael. This has been a great conversation. Friends, yeah. thanks for joining us today. Uh, this is Faith Seeking Understanding. I am Alan Bevere, and uh, the patron saint of Faith Seeking Understanding is Anselm of Canterbury, who said, I do not understand in order to believe, but I believe in order to understand. So, friends, keep seeking. <laughs>